In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Patrick. 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 One guy was supposed to embody all our beliefs and all our values and lead us. One person can figure this shit out to get us through this. Patrick. 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 Go check out Patrick Station. It's incredible. Good day, citizens. Thank you for joining me for this diary edition of The Great Everything, an exploration into ethics, culture, and society through a philosophical lens. I'm Patrick, a former banking lawyer who saw the light and quit to dedicate my life to culture and philosophy, and who then quit that to dedicate my life to taking care of my seriously ill mother, thus uh, placing some real-life stakes on all those fancy ethical beliefs and commitments of mine. Yeah, let's put those to the test daily, shall we? Let's, let's see how long my nerves last. Anyway, today is the 23rd of March, which makes it the 99th anniversary of the founding in Italy by Benito Mussolini of the Fasci di Combattimento, the Combat Fascis, the first ever official fascist movement. Hooray! Yeah, we all love fascism, don't we? No, actually, I don't think we do. I don't know, I always get those mixed up. It's confusing. And the reason it's confusing is because fascist and fascism are some of the most profoundly misused terms in our political discourse. Think about it for a second. We throw about the term fascist with reckless abandon, pretty much applying it to anyone who disagrees with us and who displays a bit of an authoritarian streak. So if you're a white supremacist, you're a fascist. If you're one of those student protesters, uh, you know, trying to shut down free speech, yeah, Antifa, they're fascists, right? Yeah, you're a fascist. You don't like free speech, you're a fascist. If you're a, a Republican president, you're definitely a fascist. I remember all those times I used to hear George W. Bush be called a fascist. If you're uh, Stalin, you're a fascist, which is ridiculous. I mean, it seems like almost an oxymoron to call Stalin a fascist. If you're a radical Islamist, you're a fascist. Basically, Anyone who has slightly extreme views, or just views that we really don't like, is a fascist. And I'd like to clear that up a bit, because it's unhelpful to be using bad terminology. A bit like, I don't know why, but for some reason in the States, liberal has come to mean on the left, or a democrat, which um, is bizarre. I mean, liberalism has nothing to do with left or right, or marginally to do with left or right. It's about a focus on personal liberties, on, on freedom of expression, freedom of belief, freedom of congregation, etc., etc., etc. It's not supposed to be a left or right thing, and that's something we'll probably talk about in the next few minutes. Anyway, I want to clear that terminology up, but also it's a matter of historical interest what fascism actually is, what the ideology stands for, because think about it this way. You know how you've probably got a lot of atheist friends. You might even be an atheist. But a lot of your friends, a lot of the people I know who are atheists, are atheists partly as a reaction to their very religious parents. So in that sense, religion has kind of shaped their worldview, even if uh, through a reaction to it. And in that sense, I think it's possible to see a lot of our current uh, liberal societies in the West as a reaction to uh, our, you know, our victory against uh, the forces of uh, fascism and national socialism in World War II. So many of our values and our beliefs have been adjusted by reference to, uh, to those systems uh, of the authoritarian, totalitarian states in Europe that we were fighting against. So it's interesting to actually understand what they stood for, in this case specifically fascism, which is not to be confused with Hitler's National Socialism. There are some significant differences, although there are also significant overlaps because Hitler was very, was very uh, admiring of Mussolini and his philosophy and his uh, ideology, and so he based a lot of his own ones on what Mussolini had to say. So it's interesting to look at it, not just to clear up the terminology and actually get a precise understanding of what fascism actually is, and so that also helps us to recognize who in today's environment and political landscape is actually a fascist and who isn't, but is maybe something similar or something quite different that we should use a different name for. But also because fascism itself is a fascinating ideology. It's very complex and it has all sorts of different roots and different influences that come from very disparate uh, regions in philosophy and, uh, and political and artistic thought. 
And so because there's so many different influences and they're coming from all these different directions, it's very hard to pinpoint what fascism really is as a monolith. It's um, often very contradictory and it's even difficult at times to understand if it is a right-wing ideology. Because in fact, you could make a very strong argument that uh, fascism is as much on the left as it is on the right. And one of the things we'll see in the next few minutes in this uh, long ramble is that fascism actually comes from the left. It is, in its origins, a socialist movement. And clues to that are, think about Nazi, right? Nazi actually is just a contraction of national socialism. And this idea of, uh, of using society, the social, on a very small scale as the root, as the kind of first principle from which to build a larger society is uh, central to the doctrine of fascism. So uh, let's look a bit closely at what fascism actually is on the year of its uh, 99th birthday. Can you dig it? I ain't embarrassed to use the word. Can you dig it? I'm talking about ethics. Can you dig it? <laughs> Damn it, Patrick! You silver tongue devil. In 1919, in uh, The Doctrine of Fascism, Benito Mussolini wrote, if the 19th century was a century of individualism, it may be expected that this, the 20th century, will be a century of collectivism, and hence the century of the state. This is very interesting because it shows how Benito Mussolini distinguishes the ideals of fascism from any other ideology, but it also shows that there's some central commonalities with other ideologies, which is why it's so hard to draw these distinctions. It's hard to draw a, a real strict dividing line with fascism uh, according to the traditional left-right political spectrum. There's a bit of everything within it. First of all, you see how we're in a Hegelian landscape. So Hegel is an Enlightenment, some might say romantic philosopher, German, who he had this idea of history as being a series of pendulum swings, right? Something happens, and then something happens in reaction and opposition to it. And then through that dialectic between the two opposing forces, a third force, the synthesis, arrives. You reach a middle ground. That's known as the Hegelian dialectic. You have the thesis on one hand, the antithesis on the other hand, and then you reach the synthesis, the middle ground. And then the synthesis itself forms the thesis in a new dialectic to another antithesis. And this series of pendulum swings, you know, getting closer and closer to the end of history, I suppose. And Marx, who was a Hegelian philosopher, he saw the end of history as uh, the utopia that we would eventually reach through revolution after and because of the decline and fall of capitalism. So he's saying that if the 19th century was one thing, individualism, this is Benito Mussolini, the 20th century must be something else. So we're already placed in this idea, this, you might almost say, left-leaning ideal of history as a series of uh, pendulum swings a la Hegel. Now, what does it mean that the 19th century was a century of individualism? This is quite interesting because individualism is an enlightenment ideal, right? It's this idea of placing the individual human being at the center of our attention and focus, like the well-being of the individual is uh, where our ethical commitments should be concentrated and what society should be founded upon. It's our central value. It is steeped in Christianity, of course, because the fact that we all have individual souls, according to Christianity, kind of makes it important to focus on the individual as someone who deserves um, respect. But the Enlightenment stripped that away from the Christian religious soul aspect and made it just an ethical, uh, an ethical obligation of ours. You know, remember Kant saying that uh, you have to treat the individual human being as an end into himself and not, uh, not a means. You can't just use someone to reach your own means. You have to respect that that is an individual with his or her, her own desires and goals and ambitions and dreams. So you can't just use them to, to fulfill whatever purpose you have in mind for your own life. 
And think about the American Constitution, the perhaps ultimate enlightenment document. You know, the uh, the individual pursuit of happiness is uh, central to to this, what the American dream is meant to be. So the 19th century is the century of of individualism, according to uh, according to Benito Mussolini, and he sees classical liberalism as being focused on individualism, individual liberties, right? And so he's seeing collectivism in opposition to this, and that's very interesting. Fascism is a collectivist ideology. It is anti-individualist. That sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? Because you think of the fascist as the ultimate asshole who just thinks about himself and doesn't care about social justice, doesn't care about other people. But ultimately, fascism is collectivist. What is collectivism? As I mentioned, it's the opposite of individualism. It's placing the collective as the center and focus of what a society should be and of our ethical commitments. It doesn't matter what the individual thinks or wants. What matters is the greater good of the collective. This is something that fascism has in common with the other great collectivist ideology, communism. Think about what the word communism means. It's the commune, what they have in common. In communism, it's all about what class you're in. The common good is the good of the great proletarian class. But what is the collective in uh, fascism? Well, Benito Mussolini says itself. It will be expected that this will be a century of collectivism and hence the century of the state. The state is the ultimate collective, the, the nation. That is the focus of what we should be caring about. That is the focus of what we should be interested in maintaining the well-being of. That is the focus of how to build a good society. So ultimately, fascism is nationalism. It's a form of collectivism that doesn't focus on class, it focuses on the nation. That's not uh, too new, is it? Ultimately though, nationalism is not all that is required to be a fascist, because there's many different shades here to fascism. That means it's not just any nationalist ideology. There's authoritarianism included within the idea of what fascism is, because you see, Fascism is born in the wake of the First World War, the Great War. The Great War, well, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a break in human history. It completely changed the way the West viewed itself. Before the Great War, you had a very different idea of what society was, what man was. Um, and also women. Now, people didn't care about women before the First World War, or some say even now. But anyway, the fact is, the First World War changed this idea of the gentleman's warfare, right? The idea that you'd meet on a battlefield, you'd shoot at each other for a while, and the person who had the most people stand, the team that had the most people standing, would uh, then, you know, walk over the others and, and grab their banners and let them move on, you know, sort of in the walk of shame, but without hurting them, like, like in that scene from The Last of the Mohicans. The, the, the World War changed that completely because technology and the machinery involved and the fact that we'd evolved after Napoleon into citizen uh, soldiers meant that you could mobilize an entire nation to, to go to war. And the technology meant that, well, you're basically walking into machine gun fire, which means a lot of casualties. Trench warfare, I mean, it was a kind of grind and a kind of devastation that nobody expected. And it was like, it was, I hate to use this word for effect, but I do think it's, uh, it's warranted. It was like a rape of the collective psychology of Europe. It traumatized people, it scarred them. And it's um, no, no uh, mystery that after the First World War, Everyone was scared of war. War was in everyone's mind. And not just any war, but the kind of annihilation war that the First World War had sort of pointed at. Now that meant that people like Mussolini and Hitler were obsessed with the state's fitness to go to war. The idea of the fascist state 
is a military state. It's an idea of the militarized citizen, which is why in places like Italy and in Germany uh, in that period, you'd see all these films, you know, you'd see all this documentary footage of young men, you know, doing gymnastics and, you know, lifting weights and getting, getting fit, ultimately. It's all about preparing people to war, kind of like in ancient Spartan society, because they were terrified. This wasn't going to be like some war in the 1600s or even in Napoleon's time. This was going to be, if there was going to be a new war, an existential war that could annihilate entire nations and maybe even the world. So there was this idea of readiness. But how can you maintain readiness in a very broad society? That's, uh, that's the big question that fascism tries to answer. How do you get your country to a state of military preparedness in a scenario where, as World War I showed, any military confrontation can result in the annihilation of your country and the society it's founded upon, especially in the case where the survival of the state is what you care about most? Because you're a nationalist if you're a fascist, you don't care about the individual. The survival of the state is at the center of your concerns. Well, you have to militarize. The fascist state is a militarized state. It's ready to be mobilized for mass warfare, for total warfare at any point in time, which means that every level of society has to be militarized. There have to be various paramilitary organizations that are linked or controlled and controlled by the fascist organs of state. My father was actually a member of one of these uh, paramilitary organizations. You know, he was born in 1935, so um, he was a child uh, under, during World War II, and uh, he was a part of what, well, most kids his age would have been a part of, the equivalent under Benito Mussolini's regime of the Boy Scouts in America, except they were militarized. They were called I Figli della Lupa, the Sons of the She-Wolf. That's a reference to uh, Roman mythology, right? The She-Wolf who suckled Romulus and Remus at her teat, and, um, and who, uh, and well, basically, they're the founders of Rome, and so there's hearkening back to those ancient ideals in Benito Mussolini's regime. And so there's all these pictures of these figli della lupa who go around, you know, these tiny six, seven-year-olds with their little rifles singing fascist songs. It's uh, kind of cute, but also very disturbing. You have to militarize. You have to get people ready to that mindset of, of uh, mobilizing for war at a moment's notice. And in a way, that's uh, something that is reflected in broader society, not just on a military level, but that idea of organization, of uh, structure, like in the military. So let's take a step back. If you look at liberalism and individualism, the kind of societies we have today, from a fascist perspective, well, it's easy to see how they'd see it as chaos, right? All these different people from different backgrounds, with different beliefs, with different political ideals, arguing about what kind of music is best, what kind of food tastes better, who's that parking spot is, and who you should vote for, is abortion good, is it bad? These kind of things are, from a fascist perspective, kind of going against the idea of social cohesion. How can we all come together as one in the case of an existential war if we all disagree with each other? Now, I don't think that that's the case. I think it is possible to unite behind broadly human ideals of individualism, of respect for each other, no matter what our differences are. But from a fascist perspective, this is just chaos. And a fascist wants order. So how do you get order? in the society at large. Well, you have to control everything. You can't let the individual uh, take control of his or her own life because that leads to chaos. So the fascist state is by definition totalitarian. It has to govern every aspect of your life. It can't allow you to be an individual with your freedoms in any aspect of life because uh, that could lead to a lack of social unity and cohesion, which is fundamental for an ordered state that has the capacity to go to war at a moment's notice. What that also means is that even commerce and industry has to be under control of the fascist state. So the fascist state is the ultimate big government state, which is another thing it has in common with the left. 
right? Think about Stalin's five-year plans. He could do these things because he had control of industry and commerce, and so did the fascist regime. They didn't necessarily own all the companies and manufacturers, but they did control all the industries and manufacturers. So everything in industry and manufacture was, uh, and commerce was geared at making the state richer and more powerful. Everything is about the state. Everything is in support of the state. It kind of reminds me of uh, Kennedy's words, ask what you can do for your country. That's, uh, that's kind of the fascist ideology. So again, we're seeing this kind of weird commonality with the left, with communism, this idea of big government. But it also should raise a little alarm bell for today's uh, political situations where you look at a conservative or, or someone who might be on the far right in the American political scenario and you call him a fascist. No, a fascist is a big state person. They want big government. A libertarian, anyone who wants to, a conservative, a classical conservative who wants to reduce the state, can, by definition cannot be a fascist because he does not want the government to interfere in how they do business and in how they live their lives. So if we distill fascism down to its core, you know, to its uh, quintessential elements, we arrive at this definition. Fascism is totalitarian, big government nationalism. And we need all three of these elements. You know, you take any one of them out of it and you're not dealing with fascism anymore, but with something slightly different. You need big government totalitarianism because without it, we've said, the fascist state doesn't have the control over the individual. It can't keep that person in line with the prevailing ideology. Fascism is collectivist, remember, so it can't have the individual breaking with the collective and just going off to do his own thing because that weakens the bonds of social cohesion. But up to this point, it sounds just like communism, right? Just like Stalinism. Totalitarian, check. Big government, check. So where's the difference? Nationalism, of course. Remember, communism is internationalist by nature. It's all about the international proletariat, the working class. That's why during the Cold War, the Soviet game was to get other governments to fall under the sway of Marxism so it could align with that ideology. It's about spreading the ideology beyond the confines of the state. Now, the fascists don't care about that. They might uh, conquer your country, they might invade you, but if they do, it's not about spreading the ideology of fascism. You are, well, to use the, the, the Nazi term, you are an Untermensch. You are uh, inferior. What, if they invade you, it's not so that they can elevate you by giving you this amazing ideology, fascism. It's so that they can exploit your resources and your people for the good of their state, for the good of their nation. That's what they care about. So it's interesting, we now have this definition, totalitarian, big government, nationalism. But there's other things that make fascism what it is and what make it truly interesting, like give it its um, unique flavor. One of them is the idea of the fascist negations. The fascist negations, I find, are interesting because they show something about fascism that is, well, some might disagree with this, but to me, fascism has always felt like a very negative ideology. And I don't mean negative as in bad, although I also disagree with it. Negative in the sense that, in a way, it's more about what it's against than what it's for. You can't say that about communism. Communism is all about reaching this ideal utopia. It's very, you might say, progressive. But fascism is just an angry ideology. It hates a lot of different things. And the three things it hates most of all are conservatism. Very important to remember this because we tend to confuse that. We tend to think that ultra conservatives are fascists, but that's not the case. A conservative is, uh, is a fascist enemy because the conservative is all about old values, old traditional ideals. The, the, the fascist is about breaking with the past. It's a very revolutionary ideology. It's very modernist. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But also remember the distinction with conservatives is uh, this uh, difference in views between big government and small government. Conservative is all about small government, fascist is all about big government. So the fascist is anti-conservative, obviously also anti-communist, despite the fact that fascism began as a socialist movement, 
the original fascist philosopher Giovanni Gentile who was a socialist. Benito Mussolini was the editor of what still today is the Italian socialist newspaper, Lavanti. So it's anti-communist, it's anti-conservative, but more importantly, it's anti-liberal. And I mean liberal in the Enlightenment sense, you know, the John Locke liberalism, John Stuart Mill's liberalism, the idea that personal liberty is what matters. Liberalism in the sense of, you know, the US uh, Declaration of Independence liberalism. So this is something that I find very important because People tend to look at a political spectrum that goes from left to right, and on one far end you have communism, on the other far end you have fascism, and in the middle you have liberalism. I don't agree with that way of looking at the political spectrum. To me, the best way to look at the political spectrum, and the one that is actually most current today, and most relevant to our times, is we have a collectivist, totalitarian end of the spectrum, which includes communism, and fascism, they're on the same side of this spectrum, they just have differences in methods and focus, and on the other end you have liberalism, and that includes conservative liberals, it includes uh, progressive liberals, it includes uh, libertarians, but basically people who at the end of the day still believe in democracy and in everyone being able to have their own beliefs, shag who they want to shag, sleep with who they want to sleep with and buy whatever they want as long as it's not too big of a gun. And uh, that's who we have all in one team opposed to the extremists who are both fascists and communists. So fascism is also anti-liberal. I'll get to, to why that is in a, in a second. But before that, I want to talk a bit about the fascist aesthetic, which perhaps is the most fascinating, or I should say fascinating, aspect of uh, this uh, truly interesting and radical ideology. The element of fascism I've always found most interesting, and certainly most distinctive, is this fascination with the aesthetic of force. Fascists are simply obsessed with the ideas of youth and energy and masculinity and speed and violence. And these are all seen as mystical forces that shape the world. It's a very mystical viewpoint. And that's interesting to me because broadly speaking, you can look at the world uh, through two different lens. I know that's kind of black or white and there's always nuance there, but in this framework, there's a scientific worldview secular, you know, where everything out there is just atoms and the void. There's nothing we can't know on principle through science, and we can discover everything that's out there. And if we can't, it's not that it's not out there or that it's invisible, it's just that our tools haven't uh, evolved to the necessary stage for us to be able to understand it. And then there's the religious worldview, which is a worldview where there's hidden forces at play, mysterious, uh, beyond science, that, that are invisible and impervious to that kind of scientific scrutiny or observation. And they're usually divine, you know, it's gods or a god, but they don't have to be. It can be secular. It can be the world is made up of love versus fear. You know, people believe that, and they're not just being metaphorical. You know, they mean that these are actual energies that are real and that have agendas, and they kind of conscript you to one team or the other, and then that somehow affects who you are and how you live in a very real sense. So it's kind of love and fear seen as mystical forces. Then there's other types, you know, energy, vitalism. You know, I, I did a show on uh, the French philosopher Henri Bergson, the vitalist philosopher. He speaks of élan vital, this, uh, uh, well, what would you call it? The spirit of history, uh, the, of vitalism that permeates all of the world and that you can't know scientifically in any canonic sense, but you can feel, you can tap into it by introspection. And that's the thing with vitalist tendencies, these mystical worldviews. You can never know them, but you can feel them subjectively, which is why they're kind of, you know, they make you raise your eyebrow in terms of, well, if it's also subjective, how can we ever talk about it objectively? But so you have these kind of mystical worldviews, you know, new age type ideas. You know, everything is moved by these uh, spiritual forces of some kind or the other. And fascism is like that. It's not as hippie as some of these other ones because, you know, the, the main force isn't love versus fear, but it's uh, things like willpower, 
you know, that old Nietzschean virtue, or the spirit of the people, the spirit of the nation. And again, these aren't just ideas in our head that we use as examples of what we should live like. They're real forces that shape who you are and the world. So that's fascinating because that is so anti-enlightenment. You know, these days a lot of people cite fascism and Nazism as bad examples of what happens as a result of the Enlightenment because they, they focus on the social Darwinism aspect, which is kind of like a post-Enlightenment idea. But I actually think that fascism is anti-Enlightenment, and I think it's hard to argue otherwise. Enlightenment comes about in the you know, 17th and 18th centuries with all these new ideas of materialism versus the spiritualism of the church, uh, science, and it's all about reason and logic, positivism, middle class, bourgeois virtues, democracy. We, we know the Enlightenment values. It's all very elegant and sophisticated and logical. And then there was a backlash. Broadly speaking, Romanticism. I also did a show on that a while back. You might want to check it out for historical context. And Romanticism is exactly the opposite in many ways, where the Enlightenment is all about these uh, progressive virtues and, and the idea of industry. And uh, in, the Industrial Revolution is a, a great product of, um, of the Enlightenment. Well, the, the, the Romantics, they're looking back at that and they're saying, oh, no, we want to go back to the forest. It's all about the wilderness and savagery. You know, the noble savage is glor glorified by the Romantics. It's this idea of progress as corrupting our vital spirit. There's some kind of spirit within each of us that is somehow being alienated and crushed by science and logic and progress. So they reject this rationalism in favor of emotionalism. The, I think the best example of this is in music. You take the Enlightenment musicians like Haydn and Mozart, and you can see it's all very elegant, it's all very civilized, it's all very polished, it's all aiming towards this classical ideal of beauty that is very refined and balanced and restrained. And then you have Beethoven and the people who came after him, the romantic musicians, were all about unbridled passion, expressivity, disheveled hair. I don't care about some elegant aesthetic ideal. I want to express my passion, my own feelings. This is who I am. The, the classic romantic figure is the Byronic hero in engaged in a titanic struggle against, well, wilderness, forces of nature, and his own powerful emotions, which is why pretty much every romantic hero ends up committing suicide. You know, <laughs> young Werther, I think he commits suicide. I'm pretty sure Pechorin in Lermontov commits suicide. Well, you know, there's a lot of suicides in romanticism because, you know, it's all just so much emotion, right? And in a way, that's kind of like what fascism is all about. It's, uh, it's very emotional. It's all about instinct and expressivity in that sense. Very Nietzschean in a way, right? Nietzsche, he talks about force and willpower and unbridled emotion and instinct as important elements, fundamental elements in us being human. He's rejecting all these ideas of elegance and restraint as being fundamentally middle class in a way that is, um, well, in a way that is demeaning. So one argument against democracy is that if you give everyone the same thing, what it does is it kind of lowers the quality of that thing. Democracy lowers quality because it lowers everything to the minimum common denominator, the lowest common denominator, which means that, I mean, ultimately, if you're going to go mainstream with something, let's say you have a very niche, high quality product. If you want to go mainstream, it's got to be understood and appreciated by everyone. And it also needs to have an accessible cost, which is going to diminish its quality. So that's a very product based analysis of it. But in general, if you want to have a podcast, for instance, and you want to talk about philosophy, for instance, in a way that everyone can understand, you're going to have to start throwing some pop culture in there. And not because you think your listeners are dumb, but because if you want everyone to listen to it, it needs to be understandable. Now, obviously, pop, pop culture is a bad example. I do that. But you need to talk about it in a way that is understandable. But then other people, 
like intellectuals, could come around and say, well, you're simplifying it too much. You're actually making it unsophisticated. So you see what the dilemma is. And people like Nietzsche and fascists, they're anti-democratic because of that. They think that basically democracy and any kind of democratization is appealing to mediocrity, whereas they want to appeal to our highest and noblest and most aristocratic values. You know, and aristocratic values in the case of um, Nietzsche and fascists, well, they're kind of uh, old Teutonic aristocratic values. You know, the warrior kings, you know, who could just do as they pleased and take what they wanted and kill whatever they wanted because their force is what legitimated their actions. They were justified merely by right of their might. So it's very interesting to see fascism within this pendulum swing of uh, a romantic backlash to the Enlightenment. And it complicates the way we see fascism because at the end of the day, we have so many different elements here and some of them are just so, how would you say, they're so in contrast with each other. I mean, think about it, how on the one hand I've been saying that the fascists are purely romantic because they they resist this idea of progress and industrialization and you know and, and modernity as being too bourgeois and middle class but at the same time they have a very radical idea of progress that is almost revolutionary i don't know if you've ever heard of uh, futurism but it's the artistic movement behind fascism it's uh, from the early 20th century and they're all focused on industry and and speed and action and if you look at at futurist artwork, Giacomo Valla, B-A-L-L-A. It's beautiful, and it is all about mechanics and science. You see these pictures of this man walking his dog, and you can see all of the movements and the permutations of the movement in the painting itself. It's kind of like, um, it, it's kind of like imagine if you move your hand through the air, and then you can see every instant of that. That's what Giacomo Balla paints. It's all about speed and motion and dynamism and industry and steam, steampunk aesthetic. So, which is it? Is 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 fascism anti-progress or pro-progress? I specifically said it's anti-conservative because it's so focused on the future. I mean, its basic artistic ideology is futurism. You see how confusing it is. Is it left-wing or is it right-wing? I mean, I guess it's left-wing because it's all about big government, but it's right-wing because it's uh, nationalist. It's left-wing because it's collectivist, but it's right-wing because it's a different kind of collectivism. Which is it? It's kind of right-wing because, but it's kind of right-wing with the whole mystical side, but it's also left-wing because fundamentally it is atheist. So. Where do you place it on a classic political spectrum? Is it looking back at the past, you know, the figli della lupa, the, the sons of the she-wolf, Benito Mussolini was all about ancient Rome, or is it looking to the future? And how do we place fascism today? How do we understand it? It's so complex. Are Trump voters fascist? Well, some of them might be, yet I'd say that most Trump voters are probably very much about small government, which is definitely not fascist. I'd say they're all pretty much pro-democracy, which is very anti-fascist. And they're not about revolution. Fascism is about revolution. This is interesting. Fascism is uh, a palingenetic ideology, which means that it's all about rebirth. You know, it's all about creating a new nation from the ashes of the old. And that might make you think of Make America Great Again. But no, because Make America Great Again is just saying, let's use the democratic uh, institutions to enact reforms that will make America as good as it used to be. Not with fascism. Fascism wants to break with the past. It's a revolutionary. I doubt that uh, Trump voters are that interested in an actual revolution that will change their way of life significantly. So, at the end of all this uh, rant on fascism, I don't know where we are. It is such an interesting and multifaceted ideology, very rich, full of different influences, full of weirdness, frankly. But one thing that I do know is that at least now, we've learned to recognize and highlight 
its main constitutive elements. You have totalitarianism, you have big government, you have nationalism, and you have this weird, bizarre fascination with force and mysticism. All of these are what constitute fascism. So the next time you're looking at some Antifa protester or Ronald Reagan and you're thinking of calling him a fascist, think again because words have a meaning and it's good that now we agree on what those meanings are. Hey guys, thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed today's diary edition of The Great Everything. And if you did, I would be massively grateful if you would consider, well, showing some love, basically. And you can do that by adding me on social media. You know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, the usual places people hang out. If you can do that, it would be a massive boost to my self-esteem, credibility, and just to my prospects, frankly. But also, preferably, if you could please leave a review or a rating, whichever is available, wherever it is you listen to The Great Everything. Uh, that's iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, all these places. I'm also on Spotify, I think. Basically, wherever podcasts exist, The Great Everything exists also. And if you can leave a rating there, a review, it would really be massively appreciated by me. It would help me grow uh, big time, I think. You see, I do this uh, for free. I've been doing it for a year now. I will always do it for free. And it's uh, quite a commitment in terms of time and effort, mental energy and all that. And I love doing it because there's nothing more beautiful to me than spreading culture, some ideas, and preferably hearing back from you on those ideas as well. So anything you can do to, to help me keep doing that, even if that is just showing some love, and that really is all I ask, that would be wonderful. I mean, it's all I ask, really, but if you also want to send me some Girl Scout cookies, I'm totally down for that. The podcast you just heard was recorded with Anchor. If you want to make your own, download the Android or iOS app completely free from anchor.fm slash podcast. That's anchor.fm slash podcast.